my name is Chris Barkham. I'm the writer creator of the All Ages comic, The Amazing Adventure of Superior Sam. And have you done any other comics before, not including Superior Sam? No, I haven't. I've done some fan fiction stuff. I've written a couple like outside of Sam comics that I would like to try to do something with, but right now Sam is my primary focus. You don't, like actual comics in like in person. It's pretty cool. I um I enjoy not necessarily being the fact that I created it and I write I enjoy the fact that other people enjoy the comic. Um, I've been able to make a positive influence on a lot of people's life through the comic, and that gives me a lot of joy. Having my own comic is very cool. Like I get to, I don't want to sound like I'm like a control freak, but like I got to, you know, design, you know, kind of come up with what the characters look like, about the stories and everything, which I really enjoy. But it's that collaboration too that I enjoy. I enjoy working with Josh. I enjoyed working with Zami. It's a lot of fun. And then it's just a lot of fun to meet people as well. So it's very cool to have your own comic and to be able to do the stuff that's associated with having a comic book. Such as? Like I said, you know, getting the chance to go around to do shows. I do public speaking. I, um, I meet fans. So I really enjoy that side of it as well. So... Gosh, yeah. Um, now, what were you doing before you were a comic creator? I used to be a police officer. I worked for the Albemarle County Police Department, which is the area around Charlottesville, Virginia, so you can kind of pinpoint it. And I worked on the evening patrol, so I was a, a street police officer. I did that for four and a half years, and I retired. I medically retired after my sixth year with the department. Now, um, for those who do not know, why did you medically retire? I was injured in a training accident. I developed a progressive nerve disease as a result of that injury, and then subsequently lost a portion of my right leg. And of course, the losing the portion of your right leg, was that a basis for creating Spear, Sam? It was in a way. Um, the, actually, the backstory on Superior Sam is when I left being a police officer, I was actually teaching in an after-school program, and one of the kids I taught was on the spectrum. And after teaching him for two and a half years, he didn't understand, like all of the other kids and my coworkers and the teachers at the school that I was at, why I was leaving. So I tried to find him a book because he was a very good visual learner, but all I found were medical journals and biographies and autobiographies, nothing that really explained to him in a way, what a traumatic amputation was and what I was going to go through. So I wrote a story to explain it to him, and that's how Superior Sam came to be. Interesting. How long have you been working on Sam? Um, so Superior Sam first came out as a children's – well, let's see. I lost my leg in 2015. I had started writing Sam in 20 – late – like – Late 2014, I started writing and developing Sam. It came out as a children's picture book in, I think it was late 2015. And then my publisher went bankrupt. And then it became a comic in 2016. Got you into comic books as a medium. So I'm a big comic book fan. I um, You can't see it, but I'm literally sitting in my office and it is floor to ceiling comic book art i have you know there's probably there's i think eight thousand something comics in here not including trades graphic novels things like that but then on top of it i used to be a really big book reader like i i could read a book but with my progressive nerve disease it's hard to focus and what happened what i found is is the more i would try to read a book regular traditional books I couldn't focus, so I would read the same page over and over again. I couldn't comprehend it, and it was very frustrating, so I actually stopped reading. And I was given a copy of Captain America, The Winter Soldier by Ed Brubaker, Steve Epting, going into one of my surgeries. I, I don't know to this day who, where I got the copy from. It was just it was a gift, and I read it, and I really enjoyed it. And what I found that I liked about it was even if I couldn't comprehend what was being said, I could look at the picture, know what was going on, and then 
move on. And I was able to finish comics, and that's what I enjoyed was the fact that I wasn't as frustrated trying to read traditional books as I was. So I st I read comics a lot. I mean, a lot. So. Who's your favorite uh, Marvel or DC character? Well, my favorite character is Captain America. And as much as everybody always thinks that Steve Rogers is Captain America, I actually prefer Bucky as Captain America. Is there a certain reason why? So for me, right after, like I said, I got the Winter Soldier going into, I believe it was my, when I had my spinal cord implant put in. But the, what I found was while I was reading the series, it was very motivating to see a character like Bucky Barnes, who is an amputee, he's missing that portion of his left arm. But what I found motivating was after Steve Rogers' death and Bucky became Captain America, it showed that a person with a disability, not just an amputee, I know that's a big similarity a lot of people like to make, but a person with a disability was able to fill in the role, you know, fill in and become Captain America and fill in that iconic role, and the disability didn't stop them. So I found that very motivating. It's more coincidence that Bucky happens to be an amputee than anything. Gotcha. That makes sense. I can understand why he's your favorite then. <laughs> it, it's a big thing. Like, I, you know, for me, comics gave me a lot. When I left from being a police officer, I moved an hour away from where I work. No friends, no family or where we, you know, I have a little family where I live now. But when we did live in Harrisonburg, where I wrote and created Sam, I didn't have any of that. I lived with my girlfriend. But comic books gave me a sense of community. I was going to local comic book stores. I was hunting for books. And particularly that Captain America Brubaker run. So. Do you have a favorite obscure superhero character? Favorite obscure superhero character? Yeah. Um, I'll tell you, Tom King made me a big fan of Big Barda in his Mr. Miracle run. That's fair. So, yeah, she would probably be, like, the obscure character, but, I mean, I do enjoy, like, my favorite villain is Dr. Faustus, which is, a you know, kind of like a B-level Captain America villain. So, I mean, when most people I say, like, I'm a big Faustus fan, they're like, who? And it's like, I like AIM you know, advanced ideas and mechanics more than I like Hydra. So, like, I do like some obscure characters, but Barda was one of those characters, when I read about her, when I read her in Mr. Miracle, I was just kind of hooked, and I really enjoyed her character, so. I know she has made appearances in, like, the Justice League, Action and Justice League Unlimited show... I'm, yeah, she's been in a couple things, and then, you know, she came out of the Mr. Miracle comics, which were Kirby and everything, so, and I didn't really, it's funny, I went back and read the Mr. Miracle run that Kirby had done and everything, and it didn't click for me as much as the Tom King portion did. I mean, I loved the art. I loved Kirby's art in that run, but for some reason, I think Barta being a mother really kind of clicked with me a little more. Granted, I have no kids or anything. It's just, I, I think it was just the way she was written and that relationship with Mr. Miracle that just really kind of worked and made her a very likable character, you know, that I had never really cared much about prior to, so. Speaking as a superhero fan and speaking as a cop, um, I, I had a strange question. Um, sure. So, have you seen... So you know the Punisher, right? Frank Castle? Yep. So have you – you know how he's kind of like anti-cop and then he thinks like the, the system is fake and like, you know, it's all a fraud, etc.? Yes. Have you seen that some cops have started putting the P Punisher logo on their cars? So I won't lie to you. They've been doing that since probably the 80s, 90s in some cases. I uh, my field training officer actually had a Punisher logo that so we have the cage in the car well we had like the glass cage the plexiglass cage uh -huh. he had a Punisher sticker that would face you know right where you know whoever we had in the back seat would see and um, I used to actually tell people all the time 
Because, you know, even before I became, like, a big, big comic book fan, you know right and wrong. Right. And I joke with people all the time. I was like, if you have a choice and you see a cop that's got a Punisher sticker on his car or a Captain America sticker, you need to go to the one with the Cap sticker. Yeah. Like, I'm not trying to incite hate or anything, but I was like, the Punisher is not a role model for, you know, for the police. He shouldn't be. And I see this all the time, and I'll tell you what. Matthew Rosenberg, his Punisher run did a great job of addressing that. Um, I actually, that was one of the very first tweets that I think I ever sent out was saying, like, I strongly agreed that the Punisher was not a role model for the police. Oh, he so. should never be. I mean, the uh, Punisher believes that the cops and the system doesn't work and it's fake and da 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 So if, it, if they believe, agree with that, then you shouldn't be cops. Now, the reason I think law enforcement agree, you know, can kind of sympathize with the Punisher is because so many, you know, people in law enforcement, myself included, we've seen the right thing done or we do our jobs right and then something in the system fails and then we see what happens to somebody because of that. So yeah. this mentality of, well, if they're just not around, they can't hurt anybody again. Right. And, and I can, like I said, I get the logic, but I'll emphasize this and I'll say it again. The Punisher is not a role model. You know, I love reading Punisher comics. I get anything by Garth Ennis, I will buy if it's the Punisher. And I enjoy a lot of Punisher stories, and he's a very, very popular character. But that said, you know, when you read about him, I think one of the best examples of the Punisher, I think, in his methods was in Civil War, the original one with Mark Millar, Steve McNiven, where Captain America recruit, you know, let the Punisher join his side, you know, because they needed him to infiltrate to get the plants to the secret prison. And then when Punisher got him and everything, and then he killed the two bad guys in front of Cap, and Cap was just like, you get out of here. This is not what we're about. Yeah. Drop to that level. Like, that showed you right there, like, you know... Versus I, I don't know a better way to describe it, but yeah, the Punisher is not a role model, but that's been going on since the 80s, 90s, since that character came out. He almost immediately, you know, with law enforcement, just clicked with his idea. Um, I will say, on top of this, uh, there was also an, um, versus Iron Man who would recruit bad guys and would pretty much tell them, hey, no killing. But yet they would kill anyways, and Iron Man was kind of just well, yeah, annoyed look by it. Peter Parker in Civil War, right? And that's my also my that's gonna be my second point. I mean, literally, Punisher brought Spider Man to Captain America. It yeah. was like, hey, look at him. I know I'm not supposed to be here, but look at the kid. Yeah, that was the thing. Like Civil War really showed you kind of the dirty side of what some of these heroes would do if they had to. But I think Cap showed that there was a line he just um. I will say, on top of all the superhero stuff, I personally love Deadpool. He's not a role model, but he's a good person, if that makes sense. Yeah. At the heart of the character, he tries to do good. He just, his ways aren't probably the best way to go. But at the same, I, I don't know who, what, what, actually I have an issue I can probably look at in a minute. Um, there's a certain author I prefer when it comes to Deadpool. Um, and what I like to, what, what the fan base has called him is the sad clown Deadpool. Okay. If that makes sense. Basically, he makes the jokes, he breaks the fourth wall, but you can tell the poor dude has been through so much crap in his life that he is mentally, physically just tired. Yeah. No, that's completely understand. I mean, that comes with, you know, even in real life, you'll, you'll just meet people that, They've been through much, they've seen it all, and they should probably walk away from what they're doing, but, you know, they need to eat, so they keep doing it. So. Right. I mean, it's one of my favorite things about Deadpool is he pushes. He Now, is he a good person? No, but at the end of the day, that 9 times out of 10 does he need to do the right thing if he has to, if he can? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and his relationship with his daughter is a pretty solid thing, too. Like, he tries to be a good father. I mean, at, at one point he even introduces Spider. I mean, him and Spider-Man has this bromance going on, and Peter's like, 
when can I see the real Deadpool? All these jokes, like, what are they? And he's like, you want to see the real Deadpool? Fine. Go to this address at this time. He goes, and as Spider-Man's watching Deadpool, he's playing with his daughter. And he introduces her, and he goes, as she walks away, he goes, that's my daughter. She doesn't know me as dad. She knows me as Uncle Wade. I can never get in this this kid's life close enough or she'll get hurt. And I'm just like, oh. Yeah, because he recognizes. I think that's at the heart of a lot of people is they're, they, they have the best intentions. They may just not either use, you know, know how to use that best intention or they, you know, display it the right way. Right. And that's why you have something like some people look at me and it's like, you know, I don't like Diplo did it like okay, I get it, but at the same point he is more than just jokes. Well and you know, that's one of the things too is when you read the comics versus just watching the movies and the T V show, you build a better sense of who these characters are. And you... that's why you know, I as much as I love the movies and the T V shows I think there is something to actually still reading all of the material or some of the material. I will say some of the best TV shows, um, including but not limited to Spectacular Spider-Man, Justice League, and the whole Timverse, which is Justice League, Batman the Animated Series, Superman the Animated Series, Batman Beyond, yeah. uh, the Aven uh, Avengers, Earth's Mightiest, uh, Earth's Mightiest Heroes, those TV shows get the characters. They do, but they also, in a lot of cases, have several seasons. True. A lot of people, you know, like, to give you an idea, like I said, I help out in a comic book store. Every time a movie comes out, I might get five to ten people that come in and want to learn about a character. Yeah. Or they like the character and they want to try to learn more. In this case, he was only in the one movie. Well, two, now, actually. A lot of people's huh? He's technically in three, but he's only done well in two. I love I love superheroes. I always have. I, I've really been thinking about them more recently, and I've I've always been growing up on superheroes. My parents, my mom's all right with it, but my dad's been a huge fan of all of his life. Uh, when he was a teenager and whatnot. So like me growing up, it was superheroes. <laughs> That's how it was for me. I mean, you know, like I said, I'm 34. You know, I was watching GI Joe when I was a kid on TV. I was huge into Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I didn't get into Power Rangers. It was never my thing. But I remember, you know, the 90s with the image boom, you know, when Image came out and the death of Superman. Like, I was reading comic books when I was a kid, but I think, like, a lot of, you know, adults, that, you know, didn't grow up with, you know, comics being so mainstream and superhero culture being accepted. When you hit that, like, 16-year, you know, 16, 17-year-old, you were like, yeah, I'm not really into this anymore. Uh, you know, see, I was the opposite. <laughs> I got uh, more. I got more into it. Well, see, that's how it goes with some people. You either kind of go down or you kind of go out. But it was like, I remember like going to seeing all the um, the prequels, the Star Wars prequel movies. Yeah. And like going to the first showings and being in middle school, and then you know, I think I saw, um, episode three when I was a freshman in high school. But, like, I had friends that were like, you see Star Wars movies? And I was like, yeah, because these things are cool, even though it was the prequel. Okay, but, like, episode three was the best one, so... Yeah, in fairness, I always enjoyed the first one, because I just loved the fight scene with Maul and Qui-Gon. That's you know, fair. I will say, though, I've rewatched it more recently, and it's not so bad. Yeah, and if you're not watching the Star Wars Clone Wars series on Disney Plus right now, you're missing oh, out. Missing out. That is the best thing to come out of Star Wars. It is, and this might be the best season of all prior seasons. I, I need to finish it, um, but I got into the Ahsoka like story arc, and I kind of just got bored of it. I'm like, are you serious? Don't get me wrong, I love Ahsoka, but I love the clones more, which is really weird to say. But like yeah, Ahsoka. And I love Rex. Like, they're oh, two, yeah. like, if you look at my desk right now, there's an Ahsoka Lego minifigure, and I have a Rex minifigure. Nice. Like, you can't find those cheap anymore. Huh? I said, you cannot find those cheap anymore. No. 
But one of the things I used to tell people was my girlfriend and I, she, I remember, I'll never forget, my girlfriend walked into the comic book store and me and my buddy who owns the store were watching Clone Wars and I forget what season it is, but it's the episode with um, 88. Mm -hmm. You remember the clone trooper that's, you know, kind of like he's not developed right. 99. He has some mental issues and things, but when he sacrifices himself to, you know, save the clones and the kids and everything. Yeah, I, I know which episode you're talking I, about. Like, you know, because we were crying because, like, and I had seen it before, but it's one of those episodes, every time I watch it, I can cry. And let me tell you, I don't cry. It's not something I can do. Like, my PTSD is so bad that crying, it does not happen for me. But that is two episodes, man, that I ball if I watch them. So I just don't watch them. <laughs> yeah. But they made you care about those clones. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, that was the beauty of that show is they took what you thought was just a generic character and they have, gave them so many personalities and you cared about them all so much. Is there anything from earlier issues you wish you could redo now? I would actually, if anything, I'd like to rewrite most of the early issues, at least one through three, just because I think after doing eight issues, and actually I've written 14 Sam stories. I've got 14 issues of Sam done. I really think my writing has gotten better, so I think I could tell the stories better and probably reduce the amount of you know words you see in a word bubble and... I've learned things too. Like, you know, I had a friend who looks at me and goes, you should never have more than 37 words in a word bubble. And I got to think, I was like, wow, this is actually really smart logic. But I also think I could have made some of the stories better, like more entertaining, I think. But at the same time, like, I don't know if I would change anything, you know, because they do mean a lot to me. Like I have this debate all the time where, you know, with Sam, because everything with Sam, I don't make any money from it. Everything that you, you know, when people buy the comic goes right back into the comic, whether it's paying for the artists who do the art in it or it's paying for the production. I make, I take no money from Sam, you know, from the sales, from the comics. But I think if there's one thing, you know, that I debate about all the time, it's can I afford to keep reprinting eight issues? And that's why, you know, I want to do the trade to try to fund a collected edition because it will be cheaper and I can keep doing it. But people ask me, they're like, well, if you don't print all eight, what are you going to print? And I'm like, well, I can look at my sales and know which numbers don't sell as well. But then there's a part of me that's like, but I, I liked this part of that issue. I like that part of that issue. Like, I don't want to not have it. Yeah, I can see where you're coming from. Um. So, but I mean, I will say that once I got it and got home, I read through the three that I got off of you, and then I read through all of my webtoons, and then I read through cool. all of the webtoons like again more recently, and then again, um, with my little cousin, like I was reading it to my little cousin, and one of the comments he had made that I thought was really funny was I was asking him we were only on like issue four or something, but I was trying to take my time to make sure he understood it was I asked him, well, do you like the comics? He's like, yeah, there's just a few parts I don't like. I'm like, oh, what's that? I don't like the first issue. What's wrong with the first issue? Sam loses his leg. Yeah, I uh, I will be very honest with you. Um, I get that all the time. It is not an uncommon comment that I get. I'm fully aware of it. I... My kind of go-to line when I hear this is, is I, you know, I tell people, I never wrote this story and told you it was a happy story. Yeah. You know, I've told many a person, I was like, I don't know an amputee, you know, that really wouldn't want to not have their limb back. Right. You know, whether they were born without it or whether they lost it by an accident, you know, there are people that are happy. We live our lives. We do the best we can. We have great moments, you know, but, you know, I, when I wrote Sam, I was like, I've never met a happy traumatic amputation person. Right. You know, 
So that's why one of the things that I do like doing shows and meeting people and talking to them is because I can kind of brace them for it. Now, I'll be very honest with you. If you ever got a hold of the book version, the children's picture book version, it is even sadder than the comic book version because I had to rewrite the story to fit the comic book form. But Azami and the way he drew it and his use of color actually brightens up what is a sad story. Hmm. And that's something that I get from a lot of people. They're like, do you really have a happy story? Is there like one where there's happiness? And I was like, yeah, you know, when you look at a lot of them down the road, like they have a happy ending. Yeah. But the in the between story, I tell a bit, I talk about a lot of tough, tough topics, especially for kids. Yeah. You know, so there's not a lot of happy stories because I'm trying to educate kids about, you know, people with disabilities or about doing the right thing or about equality. So it's tough to do these things, but I think it's an important topic. But at the end of the day, I want people to be happy. I want them to enjoy what they read. I want them to learn something, but it is kind of tough to do. So I'm never shocked when somebody tells me that it's sad. I mean, I, but at the same point, we have to get through the sad stuff to get to the happy events. Exactly. Yeah, you know, life is full of ups and downs, and unfortunately for Sam, he ha- he deals with a lot of downs, just like everybody else. It's just, you know, Sam, every time an issue comes out, it's kind of a standalone story about a different topic, and I write about topics, like I said, that, you know, don't get written about a lot. So... And they're yeah. they're tough to write about sometimes. I like later on when the girl like basically dares Sam to do a superhero dare or whatever it was. Sam yep, goes, no. Challenge. I'm sorry? The superhero challenge. Okay, that's what it was, the superhero challenge. And Sam was like, no. And like that to me, that's character development because it was, yes, totally, I can do anything you want me to do. And now it's, no, I realize what my limitations are. Yeah, that was one. So Viva is probably, look, everyone always, you know, my characters are based off people I know, by the way, with permission, but Viva is my favorite character. I tell people all the time, she's the one character that I enjoy writing the most because she is so, like, fiercely independent. And that was one of my favorite issues to write when I did it and I remember being very proud when I wrote that story and I was like, we're going to introduce a female superhero. We're going to show boys that can be, you know, girls can be superheroes, you know, and do the same things. But then when people read it early on, you know, that were giving me feedback, they were like, should you really have Sam saying no? And I was like, well, it's Sam realizing that even he has a limit to what he can do, you know, as a human being. So so I thank like, you. I'm glad you got that from that. Yeah, I like that I said no, to be honest. I'm like, okay, I see where he's coming from. I get it. Good for you. Especially for a kid. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, if you look at Sam from issue one, he is jumping off that swing set. It doesn't ma- that play, you know, ground, it doesn't matter to him. Yeah. And he loses his leg. And then by issue four, he's like, ah, no, that's not a good idea. I'm all right. Yeah. You know, he learned from his mistake. And that's something that, you know, when you read Sam, there's a lot of subtle things that are hidden throughout those issues that you might not pick up on right away, that you'll pick up on later on if you reread them. Or, like, one of the things that I tell people, there's a lot of things hidden in the panels sometimes. Like, if you look at Sam in issue one, and you look at when Sam is walking into school after losing his leg, all of the kids are staring at him. And a lot of people are like, oh, I never noticed that. And I was like, you never, you know, I mean, that's a big thing, though, the people that are different to deal with. Yeah. People stare at them. I was like, actually, a big symptom of, you know, people, you know, that are both depressed or, you know, that lose a limb or they have an accident or something with them physically changes is self-doubt. Yeah. And there's, you know, Sam talking to himself, telling himself that he can do this, because that's how a lot of those people are. They're reassuring themselves. Yeah. Oh, and someone was like, wow, that was really tough, because I'll tell you one thing a lot of people don't know about Sam. 
I go to counseling once a week. One of the people that peer reads my comics before they're ever published is my counselor. And she sees, you know, a lot of adults with PTSD like I have, but she also sees a lot of children. And I listen to her carefully when she tells me, like, this topic's appropriate, or I like how you did this, or I would take this out, or I would put this in. So, you know, one of the people that peer reads my comic, it's not just me, my girlfriend, my editor, you know, the artist. You know, I go to kids and let kids read the comic. I go to a counselor and let her read the comic and give me feedback on it. So, I will say though, those things that you're pointing out just a second ago, like you know, most people didn't realize. It. I caught those the first reading read through, but that also may have to do with the fact that I have ADD, I have autism, I you know, I have my own personal issues. Which don't get me wrong, any big topics you're you're planning on tackling that you're excited to tackle and to see people's reaction with so um i'll tell you um issue nine is going to involve a character that is missing an arm um as far as the amputee community goes it is the one character that my prosthetist and if you don't know what a prosthetist is that is the person that makes the artificial limbs they've asked me to do is they they want a character missing an arm because that's one of the, you know, one of the, actually one of the more common ones for children, you know, so they, they've asked and I'm giving that character, I'm giving a character that's missing an arm. So that's a big one. Um, I, the most commonly requested story is a character on the spectrum and how to help somebody who is on the spectrum is the storyline that I get asked the most. So I'm I, I I that's actually the story that I have struggled with the most next to issue seven. Is trying to develop that story, and I do have a rough outline. I've been asked to do you know I have people that want a cancer story, so I have a cancer story that I'm working on. But you know when you're writing a story with a child with cancer, that's a tough topic as well. And the biggest thing I try with these topics, some of these topics, is to I don't want to embarrass anybody. And I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, and I want to portray them as they want want to be portrayed. So some of these topics do take a little on the autism one because the spectrum is so diverse and so expansive that there's a lot of things I don't know if you can capture one kid. So that issue, like I said, it's the most requested. It is 100% the most requested. And actually, that community was some of my earliest fans. Um, were, came out of the, you know, the, the spectrum slash autism community. And I will never be you know, more grateful to those parents and to those kids you know, that were fans of the comic. One of the things that I'm trying to do with this story is not necessarily... There will be a character that is on the spectrum, but in a way, what I'm trying to do with it, and I'm, I don't know if I'll be able to make this sound right, is to give people advice for how to help somebody who is on the spectrum. You know, so like one of the things someone was like, you know, I had a teacher that was like, you know, one of the things that I've done is I cover my lights with a cloth so it's not as bright. Yeah. You know, um, I have a child who is on the spectrum in my classroom that wears noise canceling headphones when they get upset. So we're trying to, you know, I've talked with, and I, and I get help from the community as well, but I've asked like, what would be the most beneficial? And they're like, we don't need necessarily a superhero with autism. It'd be cool. And I'm thrilled if you do it, but give, you know, paint our children is, you know, kind of the message that I've been given paint our children as people and that, you know, they have something that they can use some help on and here's how you can help them. Yeah. Instead of making fun of them. Right. So that's kind of what the issue is, is, you know, there's a character who's on the spectrum. He is bullied because, you know, he's different. He, you know, there's an incident in which Sam then goes to the teacher and to the principal and is like, how can we help? Yeah. You know, so that's what they do. But, you know, Besides the spectrum story, I can, you know, I can elaborate more. There is, you know, I have a character that's obese who he's not necessarily fat, 
He just happened to have gotten his growth spurt before everybody else did at their age. So he's just a bigger character, and he's made fun of it, even though it's just a normal thing. Gotcha. You know, so, but um, some topics that I'm dealing with, one of the most, you know, one topic that I've been getting to is um, a transgender character. You know, I've had some people that are like, when are you going to start including the LGBTQT plus community in your comics? And, you know, when will we see more characters of different races? And one of the things that does to slow down Sam is this is an entirely self-funded project. Right. If you can put out two issues a year, I'm doing really well. But, you know, the only way I make the way Sam makes money is whether I'm speaking, doing shows, or putting my own money into it. Yeah. I would ask like josh or azami to do this for free they need to eat and be able to pay you know their you know have money i make that decision that's my sacrifice that's my giving back to the community that's how i look at it but you know for these books to come out and to be able to put these stories out it does take time and it does take money so it's not that i don't you know i have big plans like i said i have 14 issues done but some of them it's just there's a, there was a natural progression. There were set six original six original Sam stories. It was issues one through five and number seven. Issue six in the series was an add-in because I hadn't figured out how to do issue seven yet. I really struggled with seven. I rewrote it three times and then just constantly, like from scratch, rewrote it, you know, editing that issue. So seven was a tough one. So six was a fill-in issue. But, you know... As it goes, I have an outline of you know where these characters, where these topics come in. So, and sometimes something more prevalent will jump into my life, and I think that's the story that needs to come out at the time. So, I like the, yeah, you've read issue eight. Um, Super Silas, you know, is a real life kid. He's a real life, you know, that's his brother, his sister, his mom, and his dad. You know, he has a kidney disorder. Um, when I told Silas I was going to write a comic, that was two years ago. And imagine telling a kid in their family with a child with a kidney disorder that might not live two years, yeah, he's got to wait two years before he gets a comic. Yeah. It wasn't that I wanted to bump it. It was that there was a story, there was an outline, and we were going to get there. And I even joked, like, Silas's issue almost became issue six. It's just that I had that story done. In Silas's story, I never felt quite right with, and then finally I wrote it, I rewrote it, and I just it clicked, and I was like, "This is the story we're gonna publish." So, now is Silas is Silas still around to see the comic? Yeah, okay. Silas is still alive. Um, his mom actually just posted an update that he had gone in for some testing and it came back positive. He was actually at Big Lit Comic Con. He was the first person to get a copy of issue number eight. Good for him. Yeah. His family, that was like a big deal was, you know, they told me they were coming to the show, so we had to have the issue done and ready because he was going to be, if I was going to put that book out, that kid was going to get the very first copy. Oh, absolutely. So, and I actually have a copy signed by Silas, his brother, his mom, his dad, and his sister. Okay, you know, gotcha. They were all there to get his comic, and he was so excited. He was also really embarrassed, but, you know, that issue was another thing that was fun. You know, Silas's mom had read the issue, but we had redacted that, you know, his mom and dad and brother and sister were going to be in the story. They didn't know they were in there. So when they saw it, it was a whole surprise that the family didn't even know about. Gotcha. So. Um... I will say seven is one of my favorite issues. Um, Thank you. Double checking on like I was making like I was just checking which issue it was because it handles with such a heavy topic. It is seven is you know I told people I'd always written it that way and one of the questions I've gotten I I I've always gotten is where is Sam's dad? Did you do Sam as you know with just his mom? Because I grew up in a single family household. You know, my mom was my primary caregiver. And I told people, no, there there's a Sam's dad is in the series, you will see him. It's just not until the end. And people were always kind of wondering about it. And I, I wanted to talk about death, 
in a way that kids could understand. But I also wanted to talk about death with the first responder community. Yeah. You know, and because a lot of people, they don't realize, you know, that being a police officer, being an EMT, a, you know, a fire, it's a very dangerous job. And this is something that happens with it. But I also wanted to spin it into a way that, you know, what Sam's dad did and what happened to his dad, it left an impact on their child. And he was able to turn that into a positive thing. And it was also one of my favorite things with that issue is, is if you've read all the series, you know that Billy is kind of the cut up character. He's the character that I use as the comedic relief a lot. Yeah. And I gave B Billy such a serious role of telling the story. Yeah. Not something that was, you know, expected for that character. So. Yeah. But at the same point, if that's your best friend, then yeah, he would stand by you like that. He would. And, you know, that was the thing, like, Viva didn't know, so it gave the introduction to, like, how the story went down. But, like, that was a subtle thing. Like, that was my thank you. My um, my counselor is the name of Sam's counselor in the comic, and that was, like, my thank you for her. Gotcha. For me, so. That's even, that's even cooler, to be honest. Although I also, I love the fact that once the bully made the joke and made the comment, you know, I'm going to beat you up so you see your dad, dad. All the bullies kind of looked at him like, what the heck, dude? Yeah, and that was the point. Like, I always tell people, that issue's got a lot of things to it. But one of the strongest things was that sticks and stones may break, but words do hurt. And words can have an impact. And I think nowadays, with the advent of technology and social media and texting, that people don't realize how big an impact what they say to people really means to people. Yeah. And how it can really affect them. Like, that's one topic my girlfriend, she does not want me to cover is social media. Hmm. It's one topic that I get asked about a lot and about doing like a, like, either like a stranger danger or uh, like a rules to social media, like an etiquette thing. But I keep telling her that if I'm going to do it, it's going to turn into politics because I think some politics that's where the, some of the meanest things in social media can be said, you know, when you start to talk to people about people about who they are, what they believe and, you know, whether it's politics, religion and things like that, or, you know, and I was like, I try not to bring politics into Sam. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know if, of a way to do that with, you know, social media because it is such a controversial thing you know, in the way in which people use it, that I don't know if, how to tell that story, you know. Yeah. I could do a stranger danger all day. That's simple. But to tell, like, a like a reality of, you know, cyberbullying story would have to involve, you know, in my mind, for me, you know, law enforcement, you know, going to a state, you know, and trying to get, like, a law passed, you know, to help people, victims of cyberbullying, so... You know, like that's I, how I imagine doing this kind of story, and I think it would be tough. I agree with that. Do those stories, and they've done them way better than I'm going to do it. So, gotcha. Let me focus on the topics that don't get addressed. No, and I can 100% agree with that, and um, um, 100% agree with that, and I understand where you're coming from with that. Absolutely. Um, but no, I mean, like that's just. It's one of my favorite issues. I mean, I've dealt with death and grief myself, and I want to do a video topic about it. It's just one is such a heavy topic. How do you do it with such a way that doesn't make fun of it, but at the same point doesn't at, at the end of the day doesn't you know leave people sad. <laughs> I know what you mean, and the way I kind of looked at it, so to give you an idea, I had a rough outline of that script written two and a half years ago, almost three. And I remember, you know, because I have, like, all my notes, and I had an outline that I was like, one topic we should cover is death. And one of the reasons death is, you know, was a topic I wanted to cover was because my nickname as a police officer was Officer Death. Because I saw so many dead people. I actually taught some of the training on it. Like, that's just how many dead people I've seen in my police career. And it's not five or six. We're in the hundreds. 
you know, like I've seen a lot of dead people. But one of the things that I wanted to do when I first wrote the issue was I was going to have Sam's dad killed in a bank robbery. You know, and I was like, well, I don't want to put guns in the story and I don't want to have to show, you know, his dad getting shot. And then I was like, oh, we'll do it with a car chase. Yeah. And, you know, I had the car chase drawn where they were shooting guns out the windows and everything. And um, some, you know, one of my friends was like, I still think that's a little too violent for, you know, the age group that you write for. And I was like, all right. So then I thought about, okay, what if we did a car accident? in which somebody was texting, not paying attention, and they crashed into Sam's dad car and killed him. We'd get a message across about texting while driving and how it's dangerous. We'd have first respond, you know, we'd have a first responder killed in an accident. And someone's like, wow, that, that's that's heavy, man. They're like, that's a that's a heavy issue. And I was like, well what do you want me to do? Like a car chase and he dies? And they're like, it's not as heavy. <laughs> like, it, Maybe because he dies, but how many of us are desensitized to that topic because we've seen it on TV, we've seen it in cartoons. Like the idea that a police officer is in a car chase and dies in it is not a a foreign thought to us. Yeah. So it was the easiest. I don't want to say the easiest, but I think it in the best way. It was the safest way to portray. And actually, most first responders are killed in car accidents. Yeah. It's a big problem, you know. It's either fatigue or it's, you know, being pushed to the limits of their skills or not getting enough training or it's just what it is. It's a crash. You know, there's a mistake, whether it's made on the officer's fault, on somebody else's fault involved. You don't know. You know, even cars just break down and things happen. You can't control that. And I thought, you know, this was the best way. And the way the Sam story kind of goes, you know, it, it leaves a little openness to what maybe he crashed as a result of the, you know, the chase, you know, or maybe something happened and he crashed into the guys that he was chasing. Like it was a little open ended to a degree. Yeah. So we didn't really tell it, but I knew the one thing I didn't want to do is I didn't want to show guns and I didn't want to really show the accident itself either. Like however Sam's dad met his demise, we were not going to show it. Uh, yeah. I felt he didn't need to. Yeah. Especially in a kid's book like that, you really, as much as you're always told, show, don't tell, in that case, tell, don't show. Yeah, I think, I always remember growing up, because when I, The Lion King came out when I was a kid. Yeah. And it's like the go-to method to explaining <laughs> death to a child is, go put on The Lion King. Uh -huh. and I, like, I get the circle of life and all that, but I was like, the Lion King did it. You know, they show um, Mufasa falling, and you know how it goes, but they never actually showed it. Yeah. Um, so. Speaking of early issues and speaking of rough chest, whatever. Okay, something that's been picking my brain since the first time I read the comic, and maybe this is just me misunderstanding or what it is. Okay. He jumps off the um, playground. Does he end up breaking his knee? Like, okay, what happens? Okay, so I get this question a lot. You are not alone. It is actually left intentionally vague, vague, so you can kind of insert your own logic there, your own guess. Okay. Um, to give you an idea, I'll tell you why I did that. When I when I got hurt. If I try to explain to somebody how I got hurt, you would not believe how I actually got hurt. The simplest, fastest way I can explain it to somebody is that I literally tripped and fell over my own two feet, developed a progressive nerve disease, and lost my leg. People are like, you tripped and fell, and you lost your leg. And I'm like, the gist of it is that, yes. <laughs> well, my very little lemon sister know that she's going to lose her legs, though. She chews yeah, over everything. And the thing, too, is I get a lot of kids that are like, oh, I could trip and fall and lose my leg. But to explain it in the way, you know, to give you a little more detail, I was running to engage a series of horizontal targets in a training accident. I slipped in the mud. I went straight up in the air. I came straight down. I snapped my ankle. I didn't break it, but I destroyed everything in my ankle. I didn't have the best first doctor. 
My second doctor tried to fix what the first doctor couldn't fix it, fix. And somewhere along the leg, I had this dormant birth defect that was triggered, whether by the fall or by the surgeries to fix it. We don't know. We just know that one brought it on and the surgeries made it worse. Oh, but as a result of the surgeries, my leg started to die. And that's how I lost my leg. So I left it kind of open because I liked the idea of jumping off a playground is kind of a mundane thing. Yeah. But everything, it can go really wrong. Yeah. You know. But yes, it is not an uncommon thing. You're perfectly fine to wonder. I get it all the time. But I also, in wanting to make it encompass as many people as possible, if I put what happened, I think A, it would have took away from Sam Sam losing the leg some, somehow, but then B, it wouldn't fit so many different criterias for different people. I understand that. It's just, it was one page she jumps off. I'm like, all right, this is a kid's book. How's it going to make him lose his leg? Oh, he's jump. Oh, uh, okay. He's jumping off the playground. And his leg just got yeeted off. Um, I am sorry. Yeah. And Did I miss so a page? Okay. You know, remember who I wrote it for. I know, I know. And, and when you think about all of that, like, believe me, I would love to do it as a much more detailed <laughs> story, but it's tricky to do, like I said, to take it away from it. But that kind of forces you to imagine. Like, you know he landed wrong. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's kind of obvious that the, the kid landed wrong. But you could insert so many things like, I, um, I, I, I've I met many people in my life that have bone cancer. And people are like, I don't understand what the big deal with bone cancer is. And yes, cancer is bad. We know cancer is bad. But I was like, most of the people I meet with bone cancer that become amputees literally wake up one morning, go to step out of bed, and their leg just shatters. And that's and then how you wake up from a nightmare, and it's like, uh, uh. yeah, they don't, they, they never took that first step out of bed anticipating losing their leg, and they did. Yeah. Now, it's really easy to explain to somebody, yeah, I had bone cancer, it destroyed the bones in my leg, and they weren't, they were so brittle that when I took that step, it collapsed. But to just explain to somebody, yeah, I got out of bed and my leg fell off. <laughs> like, it's, it's funny, but then you got to think about it like, okay, well, how did that work? Yeah. Want that. I didn't want people focusing on the how. Yeah. I want people focusing on there was an accident and how Sam overcame the accident and the losing of his leg. I can understand that, and that's pretty much the way I was looking at it was like, okay, this is a children's book. Yeah. I, I yeah. think as a writer and even as an artist, which I'm not, I think you have a way of sometimes wanting to use your 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 style your technique to highlight certain parts that you think are more important than the other and for me unfortunately that wasn't an important part it was a relevant part but you know like you said if you asked me if i could go back in hindsight that probably be like the jason todd poll where i'd let people vote on how sam lost his life you know because it's a big question and i get it all the time the sign tutorials when they're about the deaf one in the issue about the deaf kid and the diff signs and how you drew that and whatnot how how you written it to be drawn like that if that makes sense yeah okay. um that was the whole intent of that issue actually i'm not saying i stole the idea but the inspiration for it was the matt fraction hawkeye run mm -hmm. um i love that run but one of my biggest pet peeves with it was when they did the sign language issue, they didn't tell you what was being signed. Yeah. I was like, I had to go find a deaf person, and I know this sounds bad, but it was like, I had to find a deaf person to tell me what they were saying. What's this? What's this? Yeah, and it's funny because my uh, my girlfriend's uncle is deaf. Ah. And then, you know, Michael, the character in the book, Michael is a buddy of mine, and he is deaf, and he was the inspiration for it. We, um... We met at an event. I was doing an event. I remember the event. It was a library event. And he just came up. He got the comic. And he was telling me about his, his you know, what he does. And he has a group where he teaches people that are in the public eye or, you know, how to sign and say their name. And he does this because he felt so, in, you know, kind of, you know, not included. 
Because mm-hmm. everybody else could walk up, say hello, and have a conversation. And nine times out of ten, the best he could get was a wave. Yeah. Because people didn't know it. So he was teaching people how to do this. And we were having dinner. And I just remember, I was like, he's got such a great idea here. Yeah. You know, with it going around and teaching people how to do this. Because I'll tell you what, I know how to say my name and what I do in sign language. And I've done this four times where I've had a deaf person come up and I've done this for them. And it's the biggest smile they've ever seen. Because they don't know that I know some sign language. Now, my girlfriend knows sign language and she can do pretty well and I can fingerspell, you know, but it's not the same as actually being able to talk to a degree. But when I told Michael about, you know, I was like, you know, your story inspired me. I want to write a story about it. And I kind of told him the idea. I said, I think it would be cool if we actually taught people the sign language. Yeah. So, Michael, we sat down. I think it took like two, three hours. And he actually went through, and I had to take individual pictures of him doing each sign. And then we had to simplify it the easiest way we could so Azami could draw it. But yeah, Michael took the time to, you know, to sit there and, you know, 